realnewsaustralia.com. The editor, Lee General Maddox, joins me on Talking Back the Night. G'day, Lee. Hey, Christian. Great to be with you. No surprises for guessing that a uh, big one at the moment to do with the Malaysian Airlines missing MH370. Yeah, there's a fair bit flying around. And look, to be honest, um, when I was away um, overseas on holiday, this is when this happened. And I was um, pretty much disconnected from the world during that time. So I, I learned via um, some other guests I met at the place where I was staying who, who told me the news. And um, I was I almost almost couldn't wait to get back just to start looking into it, to be honest. Well, you've got um, some, some shocking revelations that have actually come out of this. Um, and there's a lot of information that really isn't being talked about and too much information that doesn't need to be discussed, which is just being put out there by uh, all of the mainstream uh, uh, outlets at the moment. You've got um, a lot of talk happening about where the plane is, where it could have landed, all this sort of stuff. And no one seems to be asking the big questions as well. Why is it that they're looking in the South Indian Ocean when this flight was thousands of kilometres away from this area and it shouldn't have even been in that that area in the first place. It was when it was originally reported that it had crashed or had gone missing. It was over the um, the, the Gulf of Thailand, I believe. Now, in the in the very first few days of any of these sort of big major events that that seem to happen that people can't explain, that's when you really. It's usually the first 24 hours. That's when the real nuggets of truth seem to come out, and then are quickly never talked about again and and, and buried. And these are the ones that folks like myself seem to uh, seem to pick up on. Um, and, and continually keep asking, well, wait a minute, you're talking about the plane was seen in this particular area, but yet you've got reports that this flight had actually made its way and been spotted over Diego Garcia. Now, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Diego Garcia, but that's... Um, well, I, I am now, uh, or as of the last week or so. Yeah. It's, um, yeah, so I imagine you've had a lot of people talk about it. So that's just south of the Maldives. Now, Diego Garcia, as you may already know, um, has a US military naval base there which was actually leased from the um, British government, to be honest. Um, now, there were witness reports saying that um, this flight landed at Diego Garcia. And if you take into consideration the fact that they, they talk continually about how they have no idea where the plane went, yet there were some nuggets of truth, like I said, came out saying that they knew the plane had continued flying for what they believe was four to seven hours after it went missing. But... No one seemed to be asking how they knew this. And then they sort of forget, they, they, they never talked about that again, that they knew this information. Well, that, that's, excuse me, that's a massive piece of information that you need to know. You, you're sitting there saying that, so you're not you, but the, the, the media is sitting there saying that this plane has disappeared and there's, um, uh, and quite possibly crashed. Yet you've got um, Rolls Royce, who, who makes the engines on the Boeings, um, have real time data sent to them continually from every single Boeing plane in the air at any at any given time, mm. um, they had data coming through to them in their head office in in London, um, telling them that this plane was still flying, that the engine still had power, and it continued on. And you've got witness reports that have quickly now been denied by the uh, Maldive government. They're now saying that they never saw the plane. However, the the people who were on the uh, around that area who made the witness reports uh, sticking to their story and saying, yeah, look, we, we saw a plane matching this sort of description. But at that time when they saw it, they didn't actually know what they were looking at. They didn't know that this was a missing plane. They just knew that there was a very strange, odd, low-flying jumbo jet heading their way, which shouldn't be there. And then all of a sudden it comes out, hey, wait a minute, there's a missing plane. And yet these witness reports are never talked about once again because um, they're really trying to cover up the fact that this plane landed at the naval base of Diego Garcia. But this is where the speculation now comes into it. We, we're talking, what's the motive behind this? Um, the article I've put up doesn't go into that. I am doing a follow-up one, which is going to actually, uh, it, it will be an op-ed piece. So it's going to be pure sort of speculation on, uh, on my part and a, of a few other people who seem to corroborate the same sort of story. Um, and it's going to probably lead along the lines of talking about more who was on the plane. Um, you've got some very interesting um, people of interest on that on that flight. Namely, there was um, 20 engineers who worked for a company called Freestar, Freescale Semiconductor. Um, now, Freescale is a defense contracting company, and they make um, they they pretty much make all of the the military a lot of the military hardware that goes into um, a lot of the systems that they use um, in regards to RF uh, radio frequency technology. Uh, we're talking you know, microchips, microprocessors, 
you know, the, the kind of stuff that can fit inside the divot of a golf ball, you know what I mean? This is the kind of advanced technical systems that this company is responsible for. And you had 20 engineers, eight Chinese nationals and 12 Malaysian nationals belonging to that company, which is based out of Austin, Texas, that was on this flight. Um, and apparently they had filed a patent a few days, about four days prior. This company had filed a patent for its latest microchip. Um, and I need to confirm this, but um, I've seen reports saying that uh, the people who were on that patent were actually not on board the plane. However, um, there's, a lot, there's a lot more go, you, you can go into with this one here. But um, basically, if you look at and <laughs> you look at who owns Freescale, there's a company called Blackstone, which owns Freescale Semiconductor. Now, Blackstone, if you look at their um, the people who own Blackstone, who run the company, and who have, are the major investors of the company, or are on their board. You've got folks like uh, the, Roth, um, the Rothschilds. You've got um, investors like the, uh, the, Carlyle, um, the Carlyle Group, of, uh, which have members such as the Bush family, all this sort of stuff. Now, the, the hypothesis is that um, they're going to now take control of this um, technology that was stolen uh, from, this, um, from this plane, basically. But there's a whole lot more that goes into it. But, but I mean, the facts are that they knew where the plane was the entire time that the media was telling the world that they didn't know where it was. And you've still got this whole show and song and pony dance of our government now spending all this money going on a on a wild goose chase for a plane that they know may not actually even be there. Um, again, the speculation now comes into, into play that this plane could very well have been remotely controlled and landed at Diego Garcia. Everyone on could, board could well have landed at Diego Garcia, or is or has landed at Diego well, Garcia. Yeah, well, I t- I'm definitely leaning towards the fact that that's where it went, um, given the flight times and, and all of the distance it covered. It had the right amount of fuel to get there. Um, yep. The flying time in, in regards to the witness reports and the timing yep. fits perfectly as well. So it's, it's it's extremely likely that that's where it went. However, And then and what's, may, it, and what's happened in the ensuing well, three have, and a half weeks to the, to the plane and, and the passengers? It may have been refueled, yep. again, remotely controlled, and then crashed um, out, out in sea so that um, the black box, black box flight recorder will start pinging away and they'll, you know, they'll be able to find it. And it's, it's probably, it could have very well been tampered with or who, who knows. I mean, there's so many different things. It could very well be that this plane could be um, kept, repainted, um, stripped, and then used as a weapon in future for something else. You know, they okay, could... but, but what, what what's once again has happened to the passengers, if that's the case? Okay, well, in, in the article, it goes on to say that um, there's, if you wanted to basically take out everyone on board that that plane, they would f- simply fly at an altitude of 45,000 feet for about 45 minutes and slowly depressurize the cabin, which would then starve everyone on board of oxygen and kill them silently, basically. Or... And you, you would just remove them. Or we just have no idea what has happened to this plane. That Correct. could be the other possibility. That, that, there's, there's a lot of possibilities, but um, a lot of the evidence that is there, speaks for itself, and has definitely led people on a wild goose chase, and I think we're wasting our time looking for this plane, to be honest. I don't think we'll ever see it again. All right, another story that is getting plenty of reads and plenty of uh, comment on realnewsaustralia.com, the uh, latest on the Trans-Pacific Partnership. All right, we're still at um, we're still on the negotiating table with the Trans-Pacific Partnership. There's a whole bunch of different chapters in the Trans-Pacific Partnership. We'll just call it the TPP for short. Um, a lot of these cover... Uh, it. it it's regarded as a trade deal, but that's a very broad term and it's not very accurate. It does cover trade, but there's a whole lot of other things in there that it covers that you sort of think, uh, what's that to do with trade? You know what I mean? Like uh, it, it covers things um, such as food labeling. It'll cover things such as um, internet usage, um, copyright laws, environmental laws, there's a, there's a whole range of things in there where you're sort of wondering why that would be part of a trade deal with um, nations like this. These are the people that are on board with this thing. It's Australia, Brunei, Chile, Canada, Japan, Malaysia, Mexico, New Zealand, Peru, Singapore, okay. US, Vietnam. So there's a whole bunch of these countries involved here. The scary part about the TPP is they're not talking about it. And not only are they not talking about it, you're not allowed to talk about it and you're not allowed to know anything about it. They're not allowed to release any information about it. The only people who can actually um, have anything to do with the negotiations of, the, of this trade deal, this massive trade deal that's going to affect our lives, uh, there, there's corporate lobbyists 
who have been allowed to view the um, the documents and are now allowed to uh, debate the documents and so forth. Um, one of the other scary things of this, put it, put it this way, there's if the government, our government, the Australian government, can actually be sued by companies for for making laws in our interest, in the public interest. So let's take for example that you've got all of these companies doing uh, fracking or you know unconventional and conventional gas mining in Australia. Say that the Australian people, we all stood up, we had uh, the government act on our behalf, pass a law to say that fracking is now banned in Australia. May, you know, either pending um, investigation of its safety, blah, 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 or, or just banned in general. The TPP, if there is a, a clause in the TPP which is very likely to, to go through, it's called the Investor State Dispute Settlement, the ISDS. If this little sucker is in that TPP and we sign onto it, what that will allow the companies involved to do is to sue the Australian government for things like loss of income, um, anything to do with their company having no longer being able to trade because we made a law. And now, even if it's our high court, the highest law in our, in our land, if they also say, yep, no fracking, this is going to allow these companies to take our Australian government to court and sue us for loss of, loss of income and damages because of this, rather than just saying, oh, okay, they've passed the law, we can't do anything about it. So that's, that's one of the main things. So you're going to see a whole host of things happen if this goes through, and it's, it's really scary, to be honest, Christian. Lee General Maddox, the editor of realnewsaustralia.com.